When you're the President of the United States of America, you can eat whatever you like. But a few of our former leaders took whatever too literally. Whether mouth-watering or bizarre, these are the most talked about foods the White House has ever served. Let's start things off with George Washington and his famous hoe cakes. Old George was a man of simple taste, despite all the pomp around being the first president. He loved himself some hoe cakes, which are kind of like pancakes, but with a twist that colonial folks appreciated. Hoe cakes are made from cornmeal, water, salt, and a bit of fat. Some folks add in milk or eggs if they had them, but the basic version was all about survival. They were called hoe cakes because they were traditionally cooked on a flat iron hoe over an open fire. Simple, hearty, and easy to whip up on the fly. Our first president liked them served up with honey or butter, especially for breakfast. They'd be soft and slightly gritty from the cornmeal, and with that sweet honey, it was something he'd look forward to every morning. I reckon growing up on a plantation where corn was plentiful made these hoe cakes a reminder of his roots. They kept his feet grounded, even when his head was buried in the business of building a new nation. Next up is William Henry Harrison. This one, well, let's just say I'm not quite sure how to stomach the idea, but it's squirrel stew. Back in Harrison's day, squirrel was a staple protein in frontier America. Squirrel stew, well, it's exactly what you'd think. Squirrels boiled up in a pot, at times with some root vegetables like carrots or potatoes, a bit of onion, and maybe some herbs. Harrison grew up in the wilderness of Virginia, where hunting your dinner was more common than going to the market. Squirrel meat, believe it or not, was considered pretty tender and gamey, like a cross between chicken and rabbit. I suppose it was more about necessity than taste, but they say Harrison had a soft spot for it. I gotta say though, chewing on a squirrel tail ain't exactly my idea of a fine meal. Now, James Monroe, he had more refined tastes, his favorite food is something I can get behind. Spoon bread is a southern dish, a cross between corn pudding and cornbread. Soft, almost custard-like in texture, it's made with cornmeal, milk, butter, and eggs, then baked until it's golden on top but still spoonable in the middle. Think of it like a warm, creamy, corn-flavored cloud that melts in your mouth. Monroe, being a Virginian through and through, grew up eating this dish especially when corn was abundant in the South. Spoon breads got that perfect balance between savory and a bit sweet, thanks to the corn. I imagine Monroe looked for the comfort of it, the way it just sticks to your ribs and brings a little taste of home wherever you are. Abraham Lincoln was a man who didn't care much for fancy foods. Honest Abe, he liked things simple, Living through tough times in a log cabin probably had something to do with it. His favorite meal? Chicken fricassee with biscuits. Now, if you aren't familiar, fricassee's an old-fashioned dish where you take chicken pieces, brown them up real nice, then slow cook them in a creamy, savory sauce made with butter, flour, and sometimes a splash of wine or broth. Throw in some onions, carrots, maybe a bit of garlic if you had it, and let it simmer till that chicken's falling off the bone. Lincoln liked to pair it with biscuits, the buttery, flaky kinds that sop up all the gravy left on the plate. Oyster stew was another one of Lincoln's go-to dishes. Now, oyster stew might sound a bit fancy, but back then, oysters were dirt cheap, especially around the East Coast. Cook up a few fresh oysters with cream, butter, and a few spices like salt, pepper, thyme, and let that stew get nice and creamy. It was a meal that could warm you up on a cold Illinois night. And after all that, what did Abe like for dessert? Good old apple pie. Nothing complicated, just a slice of classic American apple pie. Sweet, tangy apples, a flaky crust, and maybe a scoop of cream if he was extra honest that day. If you're talking about Martin Van Buren, you're talking about a man with some, let's say, unique tastes. That fella had a fascination with boar's head for dinner, and if you ask me, it's a bit of an acquired taste, one I don't think I'd ever be able to stomach. His love for this, uh, delicacy started back in his early political career when he traveled to Europe and got introduced to all kinds of extravagant dishes. Boar's head was something of a showpiece over there, 
a symbol of wealth and status. It was literally a whole boar's head, roasted up and brought out to the table with its teeth bared and eyes all glazed over. They'd stick an apple in its mouth, dress it up with some herbs or fruits to make it look a little less, well, gruesome. The meat itself is dark and gamey, tough if not cooked right, but Van Buren took a liking to it. They'd slow cook it with all sorts of spices and marinades to soften it up, but still, you're sitting there carving pieces off the snout. Just imagine digging into the cheek meat, or maybe the tongue if you're feeling hungry. It's rich, a little greasy, and has that wild taste of the forest. Fascinating, sure, but I can't say it'd be my first choice for a meal. Van Buren, though? He couldn't get enough of it. Liked how it made him feel connected to that old European royalty. Thomas Jefferson. Tommy was quite the foodie even went to France and came back with all kinds of ideas. And one of the things he picked up over there was his love for mac and cheese. Jefferson had a taste for the finer things, and he was so smitten by the cheesy pasta dishes he tried in Europe that he brought the recipe back to America. He even had a special pasta machine imported to make sure the macaroni was just right. Jefferson's version of mac and cheese was more refined than what we think of today baked in the oven with a creamy rich sauce made from parmesan or maybe even gruyere, mixed with butter and milk. This was a dish he served at fancy dinners in Monticello, where he'd wow guests with his European-inspired cooking. It's funny to think how something as humble as mac and cheese became a presidential favorite, but there you have it. Zachary Taylor was a man of the South, and his favorite food was something called callus. Now, most folks these days might not know what callus are, but down in New Orleans, especially back in the 1800s, they were a real treat. Callus are little fried rice fritters made with leftover rice mixed with flour, sugar, and a bit of yeast, then fried up into golden crispy puffs. They're sweet, but not too sweet, kind of like a donut but with a bit more chew thanks to the rice. You'd often see folks eating callus for breakfast or as a snack, dusted with powdered sugar. Taylor likely developed a taste for them during his military years down in the South. They were easy to make, filling, and they had that delicate balance of crunchy on the outside and soft on the inside. Millard Fillmore wasn't a president most folks think of often, but he had one favorite dish with a name that raises eyebrows. Resurrection Pie. Now, don't let the ominous name scare you off. It was called that because it resurrected leftovers from the previous night's meal. You'd take whatever you had, bits of meat, maybe some vegetables, and toss them into a pie crust. Add a little gravy or sauce to hold it all together, and bake it up until the crust is golden and crisp. Fillmore had a practical streak, and this dish was practical as they come. It kept waste to a minimum, and while it might have started as a way to use up scraps, it could be mighty tasty. That mix of savory fillings wrapped up in a flaky crust, well, it was comfort food, plain and simple. The name might make you think twice, but the pie itself was hearty and satisfying. Fillmore loved it for its simplicity and thriftiness, and back in his day, nothing went to waste. Before we move on, I want you to promise me one thing. You'll give this video a like if you find our next food shockingly strange. Okay, let's keep going. Chester A. Arthur was another one with some odd tastes. Turtle steak, if you can believe it. Yeah, turtle. Now, I know folks down in the bayou still eat turtle soup, but a turtle steak is a whole different ball game. They'd take the meat from the turtle's legs and cook it up like you would any other steak. Turtle meat's a weird thing. It's got different textures depending on where it's from. Some parts are tough, others are soft, and some folks say it even tastes like a cross between chicken and fish. It's been said that his turtle of choice was the diamondback terrapin, a species that was a food fad victim driven to the brink of extinction by people like Chester A. Arthur. He was truly a man of his time, but for the life of me, I can't imagine enjoying it. Just thinking about cutting into a turtle steak, 
tender and chewy in parts, kinda stringy with a briny taste. Well, I'm both disgusted and curious at the same time. They'd pan fry it up with some butter and herbs and apparently it was a delicacy. Arthur, being a man of refined tastes, likely saw it as something that set him apart. But I tell you, the idea of gnawing on a turtle leg doesn't sit quite right with me. Interesting how folks' tastes vary. Herbert Hoover's taste buds were thankfully a bit more, well, down home. Hoover had a real fondness for sweet potatoes with marshmallows. Now, this dish might sound more familiar to you, but back then, it was only a decade-old combination. You take some sweet potatoes, mash them up real good with butter, a bit of sugar or cinnamon here and there, and then you top them off with a layer of marshmallows before popping it in the oven to brown. It's sweet and sticky, with that melted marshmallow turning golden on top like a sugary crust. Hoover's taste for this dish likely came from his appreciation for the combination of sweet and savory. Sweet potatoes by themselves are already rich and earthy, but add in those marshmallows and you're talking about a dessert-like side dish. Some folks say the juxtaposition of flavors and textures, the soft, buttery potatoes with the caramelized marshmallows, just hit all the right spots. It became a bit of a holiday tradition for some families, and Hoover was no exception. He had a sweet tooth, and this dish scratched that itch. It's a bit different if you think about it, but it makes more sense than roasting up a boar's head or frying turtle steaks, I'll tell you that. Here we have Harry Truman, a man with simple tastes and strong opinions, especially when it came to his steak. Now old Harry liked his steak cooked well done, and I mean well done, not a touch of pink in sight. Nowadays, folks might turn up their noses at that, but Truman didn't care. He wanted his steak cooked through, no ifs, ands, or buts. He was a plain-spoken man and his food reflected that. He'd get a big, thick cut, have it grilled or pan-fried until it was good and charred on the outside and well-browned all the way through. No fuss, no fancy sauces, just salt and pepper maybe and a stiff drink on the side. His preference for a well-done steak was a matter of personal taste, but also, I reckon, a bit of practicality. Back in his early years, Truman worked as a farmer and a haberdasher before getting into politics, so I'd bet he had a straightforward, no-nonsense approach to food. A well-done steak meant it was safe and hearty, and it matched his down-to-earth style. He'd probably have it served with some simple sides, potatoes, maybe some green beans, just like a solid, no-frills meal that filled him up after a long day's work. Dwight Eisenhower's tastes leaned towards love, as he had a real sweet spot for his wife's cooking, particularly her million-dollar fudge. That's right, Eisenhower's favorite treat was this rich, decadent fudge that Mamie Eisenhower whipped up. This fudge is no ordinary candy, it's made with a lot of butter, sugar, and cocoa, creating a creamy, melt-in-your-mouth texture. The story goes that Mamie's fudge became quite famous, so much so that it was often referred to as Million Dollar Fudge because of its reputation and the high demand. Eisenhower appreciated Mamie's cooking, and this fudge was a particular favorite of his. The sweetness and smoothness of it were likely a comforting reminder of home, a little indulgence that brought him joy amid the pressures of the presidency. The fudge was so beloved that Mamie even shared the recipe with the public, and it's still a cherished treat for many today. I guess when you've got a homemade sweet like that, it's no wonder it became a staple in the Eisenhower household. John F. Kennedy was a Massachusetts boy, and his food choices reflected those roots. He had a real affinity for a good bowl of New England fish chowder. Chowder up there is a serious business, and Kennedy grew up with it. He wasn't a fond eater, but he took time to sit down to a steaming bowl of creamy broth thick with chunks of fresh fish, potatoes, onions, and sometimes a bit of bacon for good measure. That chowder wasn't just food to Kennedy. 
It was a reminder of where he came from, those windswept coasts and salty sea air of Cape Cod. The flavor of New England fish chowder is like no other, rich but not too heavy, with the briny taste of the ocean from the fish balanced by the creaminess of the broth. You'd throw in some crackers, maybe a dash of pepper or a pat of butter, and it'd warm you up from the inside out perfect for those chilly New England nights. It's a humble dish, but it's got depth, and that made it a favorite of JFK's, grounding him in the traditions of his home even as he became the leader of the free world. You can picture him, after a long day in the White House, sitting down to a simple, hearty bowl of chowder, thinking about those Kennedy family summers in Hyannis Port. When it comes to Richard Nixon's love affair with cottage cheese and ketchup, well, you just gotta wonder how a man could develop such a taste. It's a combination that leaves most folks scratching their heads. But Nixon was known to be a bit eccentric, and this meal was no exception. Apparently, he got into the habit of eating cottage cheese because he thought it was healthy, low fat and full of protein. But then he went and did something most people wouldn't dream of. He added ketchup. Now I've tried to figure out why he might have liked this odd combo. If you think about it, maybe the tanginess of the ketchup brought some kind of balance to the bland, creamy cottage cheese. A little sweet, a little savory. It's strange, no doubt about that. But Nixon liked things his own way. In fact, he'd have it for breakfast quite often. Can't say it's a meal I'd recommend, but for Tricky Dick, it hit the spot. Maybe it was a comfort thing, something he could rely on amid the chaos of his political career. I guess if you think hard enough, you can almost see the appeal. Almost. Before becoming president, Ronald Reagan was famous for his movies, and when he was president, he was famous for having a sweeter indulgence, jelly beans. And his love for them had an interesting backstory. See, Reagan had been a smoker for years, but when he decided to quit tobacco in the 60s, he turned to jelly beans as a way to curb those cravings. He'd keep a jar of them on his desk and was known to munch on them during meetings, at events, just about anywhere. It wasn't long before it became a bit of a trademark for him, something people would talk about on a slow news day. Those bright little beans made headlines thanks to him, believe it or not. His favorite flavor? Licorice of all things. That bold, black licorice taste isn't for everyone. It's strong and a bit polarizing, but Reagan loved it. And because of him, licorice jelly beans became more popular than they'd ever been. During his presidency, it wasn't out of the ordinary to see bowls of jelly beans laid out at events or even sent to world leaders. Can you imagine? Diplomacy over a handful of jelly beans. Reagan sure had a way of keeping things high-spirited, even when they weren't. And that's it for today. If you were president, what food would you have the White House chefs making every day? I would love to hear your answer in the comments below. If you liked the video, please feel free to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for stopping by.